Good evening, church. It's a really special night tonight, and I'm overwhelmed and overjoyed. And it reminds me of Hebrews 3.13. It says, as long as today is called today, encourage one another. And this lady and her testimony, as I heard it last week, was an encouragement to me. To see how we encourage one another as we overcome obstacles in life. To live for the praise and the glory of Jesus Christ. So, without any delay, I want to introduce you tonight, Miss Sue Thomas. What a joy to be with you. I've escaped Ohio and the harsh winter of snow minus 20, and it was my prayer, please God, take me south. He answered that prayer abundantly. The day that we left, it was minus 20. The first day that we were here, it was 81. Now that is answer to prayer. Before I go any further tonight, I need to let you know that um, I am not a pastor. I'm not a preacher. Uh, I hold the faith for myself that I will allow the men to lead and I will follow. I am also not a teacher. Eh? But if there would be any title that I would carry through life, it's that as a witness being profoundly deaf since the age of 18 months. My eyes have been everything for me. To behold the majestic splendor of his beauty, all of his creation, and to be able to communicate with my fellow man by reading lips. Now, <clears throat> I need to share with you that as a witness, I follow the same footsteps as long ago, on that first risen Sunday morning, as Christ revealed himself to a woman and told her to go to the disciples to make him known. I followed. Now, there's a lot of times when I go in the churches, people kind of get all excited. They think they're getting this big celebrity to come in. Um, Big, yes. Celebrity, no. I am God's greatest sinner, saved by his grace and his grace alone. Now, I'm going to share my story tonight, and I'm going to share it in them. And if there would be another name for my story, it would fall into two categories. And basically, Hollywood with uh, Bruce Willis would either name it Die Hard, or they would name it The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Okay? But whatever rate, the story that you're about to hear is true. The names have not been changed to protect the innocent. I'm guilty as child. 18 months. As a child, I had normal hearing. Early evening, I was watching TV when all of a sudden I turned up the knob full blast. My brothers ran up, turned the knob down. I turned it up, they turned it down. Mom and Dad came running into the room to find out what all the racket was about. They took one look at me, thought I was tired and cranky, and they put me to bed. That night when my parents tucked me into bed, neither of them realized it would be the very first long, silent night of the rest of my life. It wasn't until the next morning, as sounds were going off, my mom was talking. She realized I was totally oblivious to my surroundings. She grew concerned, called our neighbor who was a nurse, and after a lot of discussion, I was placed in the car and rushed to the hospital. There the doctors examined me, turned to my mother, and said those words that would follow her the rest of her life. There's no hearing there. She's profoundly deaf. And from that moment on, doctors and educators alike began to share with my parents it would be best to put me to a deaf institution, that I never learned to be able to speak 
and I'd have a hard time just simply learning. I was their only daughter. I was their youngest, and they didn't want to send me away. And with that, I took a vow to do everything possible to enable me to live and to survive in the world of sound. One of the first tools was to give the child a voice. Through seven years of speech therapy, with my hand on my therapist's voice, where I could feel her vibration, I would try to make the same vibes in my own throat. As I looked in the mirror and saw her form her mouth as she said the word, I looked in that same mirror forming my own mouth to be able to match what I just saw. Over and over, day in and day out, for seven years, she never wavered and she gave me the voice. And yet, she had been given such a gift by God that she knew when she had gave everything she had and knew that I needed more help, that she passed me on to a voice teacher. And with voice lessons, it took my voice to be able to fluctuate up and down and up and down. And after voice, there came dramatic reading where all I did was recite poetry for articulation and enunciation. In spite of all these years of therapy and lessons, I know I still talk funny. And people will say, oh, no, you don't. Oh, but I know I do. Well, how do you know that? Well, I can be at the airport, a hotel, a restaurant, anywhere at any time and place, and somebody will always come up to me and say, where are you from? You really have an accent. <laughs> it's just a little bit different. And yet, I've been claimed to be German. I've been claimed to be British, South African. The only one that hasn't claimed me is the Chinese and the Japanese yet. But basically, give it up more time with the right wind. Who knows, one day, I just might sound just like them. I don't know. But it was the voice that got me in more trouble than anything else. It was the voice that would lead me to total despair and isolation. You see, this little kid that had a couple of brothers wanted to go to school with them on the yellow school bus. I was placed in the public school system, being the only deaf child I sat in the front row to try to read my teacher's letters. Opening day, the teacher instructed to the class that we were to stand beside our desk and introduce ourselves to our classmates. It became my turn that day, and I got up very slowly and very proudly. I looked down at my classmates and said something like, ah! And with that, the entire class erupted in laughter. Those kids were laughing so hard that day, I turned around to try to figure why everybody was laughing. And when I couldn't figure it out, I just sat down. But I came to realize that every time I was to open my mouth, the entire class would erupt in laughter. I got to the point why I wouldn't open my mouth. I remember sitting in that front row, watching my teacher ask all sorts of questions, like, what's the state capital to Ohio? And I would sit and wait for the answer, only to see her break out into a big smile, shake her head, and say, very good, what's the state capital of Pennsylvania? I never realized that some smart kid behind me was raising his hand, giving the answer. As a result, I went through all of my school days getting just about all the questions. I never got the answer. And my grades became D's and F's. And one day my teacher came up to me at my desk and she looked awful sad that day. And she reached down and she took my hand in hers and she led me out of the classroom. And that day it seemed like it was an awful long one. And that was the day I entered another class. I entered what was known 
as the dummy class. And now all the kids had more ammunition to work with. I just didn't talk funny. I was now the dummy. Twelve years of my schooling was spent in total silence without the understanding of what was being taught. Twelve years was spent in entire silence by me not opening my mouth once. My mom basically tried to encourage me, my parents as well, sharing with me that there was a supreme being, God, and I was created in his image. And that as long as I kept my hand in his son, Jesus, there wouldn't be anything that I couldn't do or anything that I couldn't become. They embedded in me over and over and over. God never makes a mistake. And you know, as a simple faith of a child, I truly trusted my parents. And I truly believed that God didn't make a mistake. But as the years went by, and the isolation and the loneliness overtook me, I began to question if God had made a mistake. Along the journey, God gave me different escapes, open doors in a unique way, whether it would be a skating ring where I could lace up my skates and go as fast as I could and nobody could touch me, where I became a champion skater at the age of seven or whether it was a typing teacher who had set out with the mission to make every student the cross truth threshold, to be the fastest typist in the history of the typewriter. And just because I was deaf, I wasn't about to be a student. That woman worked with me day in and day out. And I can remember typing 18 words a minute, 32, 57, 93, 128, 145, Oh, I think I sneezed at one seventies thing. I finally maxed out on that typewriter at 198 words a minute. And this teacher knew something that every teacher should have known. No dummy can type, be typing this fast. So she came to me and she said, you have one more year, you're out of here. What do you want to do? And for me, at that time, it was the most embarrassing question. I finally blurted out that day, I want to go to college. She couldn't believe it. Basically, she had to ask the question, why? I mean, she knew my grades were D's and F's. She knew how I hated school, how everybody laughed at me. So she just couldn't believe it when she heard me say, I want to go on to school. And that was really embarrassing that day when I finally blurted out and said, because I just want to be like everybody else. She believed in me. And she began to work with me one-on-one. And through her life, I went to college. I just didn't realize it would take me eight years to leave the place. Not four, eight long years. I finally got that diploma, and I thought the world couldn't wait to hire me. After all, I'm a college graduate. Boy, was I wrong. The world wouldn't hire me, not at all. Why? I couldn't use the telephone. She's deaf. She might misunderstand. Now, we can't have it. With that, I went back to the same hearing and speech center that taught me to speak. Pounded on their doors asking for a job. I know they felt sorry for me. Why? They hired me. They didn't even have a job for me. I was like a go for a jack of all trades. And you know, some days I remember taking paper clips out of one box, sticking those paper clips in another box, and then putting them on the shelf. But I was only there a short time. When God, that had wrote my script in life, was taking me to a new chapter. You see, It was a friend at that hearing and speech center 
who in turn had a friend that lived in Washington, D.C., who in turn had a friend that worked for the Department of State, who in turn had a friend that worked for the FBI. Now you're following this. This is important. Through a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend, from Youngstown, Ohio, to Washington, D.C., I get word that the FBI is looking for deaf people. And if you don't think that I panicked, I thought to myself, what did we do? <laughs> it took them a long time to call me down that day. They said, you didn't do anything, Thomas. They just want to know if you want a job. So I want a job. Somebody was finally going to hire me for who I was. Scratch that. I'm going to be with the FBI. I couldn't wait to get to Washington, D.C. The first week was like a dream come true. They took me around. They introduced me to all the agents. After all the introductions was over, they took me downstairs to the firing range where all the agents practiced their target shooting. That was their first mistake. Their second mistake is when they handed me a Thompson 45 submachine gun. I shot up their entire ceiling that day without even trying. It was a long time before they let me go back downstairs. And then I started my training to become what was known as a fingerprint examiner for the FBI. Within the first five minutes, I realized I had made the greatest mistake in my life. Someday, when you don't have anything else to do, take a look at any one of your fingers really close and look at all those funny lines. That's fingerprint. It was my job eight hours a day and five days a week to count every single one of those lines on that finger. And I can honestly tell you, if you've seen one fingerprint, you've seen them all. Get me out of here. One day my supervisor comes running and she's all upset. And she tells everybody to stop everything. She looks at me and says, Thomas, they want you at the front office. There's only two reasons the person goes to the front office. Either to be terminated from their job or to be interrogated by the FBI agent. I walk into that office that day. There's nine men standing on the walls. Each of them in three piece suits. They look typical like g -men. They take one look at me and they tell me to sit down. And the question started. And they went something like this. Miss Thomas, we understand that you read lips to communicate and you do a very good job. But there's only one thing we want to know, just one thing. Do you watch TV? Do I watch TV? That's all you guys want to know? I mean, is it a federal crime to watch TV? I confess, I watch TV. Well, is it difficult for you, Miss Thomas? Do you get anything out of it? Well, yeah, I do. I mean, no, I don't. I mean, I don't know. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and if the camera's on the person, I can see their lips, I can read them, but so many times the camera's not on the person, there's no lips for me to see if I don't understand anything. Well, how about movies, Miss Thomas? Do you go to movies? Is it any better for you? Yes, sir, I go to movies, and it's a lot better, it really is, you know. The lips, they're a lot bigger. <laughs> on and on went the questions, and I came to realize that the FBI had a large problem. They were working on a case in which they video filmed the suspect. But on this particular case, when the camera activated, the sound mechanism failed. They had all this film with the bad guys talking. They just couldn't hear it. And they wanted to know if I would watch it. And if I got any words to write down the words, what they were saying. I said, sure, no problem. From that day on, I never went back to reading fingerprints. I read lips for the FBI. And to sum up my job, I followed the bad guys around. I read their lips. 
that I went and told the good guys but the bad guys were saying. And they even paid me to do it, too. <laughs> and overnight, like the snap of a finger, I finally made it in the world of sound. Good job, good pain. And at the age of 35, I lived in the fast lane of Washington, D.C., celebrating my success. And there was only one problem. In my journey of 35 years, I had developed carrying some baggage on my back. And with each passing year, that baggage was getting bigger and bigger, or I resented it, or I hated it, or that I despised it. And what was that big bag filled with? All the hatred, despise, resent of being deaf. I hated being deaf. And by now, at the age of 35, I am totally convinced God made a mistake. Oh, yeah. I'm an expert lip reader. I, my prime one-on-one. -on -one. I can do two people. You'll talk, you'll stop. You'll talk, you'll stop. You'll talk, you'll talk, you'll talk. I get it. For every person that you add, I start deteriorating, and I can't do it. Because somebody's going to talk, and I've got to find out who is. By the time I found them, they said a word, a sentence, a paragraph. I miss it. I can't do it. And the very thing, and the only thing that I ever wanted in my life was my hearing. All I ever did was cry out to God. Give me my hearing. Let me hear the answer was always the same. The great silence. I was convinced God made a mistake because in his creation, when he created me, he created me with a heart that absolutely loves people. Oh, I love people. I can't get enough of people. But I can't be with people. I mean... It is so big on my list of being with people that on that day when I stand before Kim and he opens the book of life and he goes down to find my name, he'll find it, and there's going to be a hyphen, and it's going to say, greatest party animal. I love a party. I love the laughter but I can't be there. Did you ever want something so much that you would do absolutely anything, anything to get it? Well, 35 years of age. At the FBI, I was known as their secret weapon. I had the money, I had the name, I had the prostitutes. And yet, I have this package of garbage on my back that I couldn't get rid of. So I set out on a mission to find God. And he brought me to Columbia, South Carolina, which is now Columbia International University. And I went to seminary. Now, most people go to seminary to learn the Bible, or to be a missionary, or to become a pastor, that's not why I went to seminary. For none of those reasons. I was on a mission for one reason and one reason only to find God, to make him confess he made a mistake. You couldn't have made a heart that loves people and allow the silence to overtake it where I can't be with people. Something's wrong with this picture. You made a mistake. 
So I guess this time and I, and God was waiting for me there. Oh, was he waiting? He knew I couldn't be with people. So he had 21 people there waiting for me. 21. These 21 were students in my classes that we ate the meals together. We asked fellowship. We sang the hymns. We prayed. 21 people. Daily basis, we were all thrown together. And basically, they looked at me and they thought I was happy, go, lucky, and basically just the party life, the party animal, having a great time. But what they never knew that when I left their midst and I went back to my apartment, I destroyed everything that I could get my hands on. Everything with the hatred and rage of being in their mouth and not having the understanding of what was going on and God wasn't changing my plight. And basically I said, if you won't do it, I will. I will. My own selfish, sinful nature, I turned from God and went my own way to get what I wanted. And I did this in a very unique way. I went to one of my friends and I told her a lie. I told her that I had a terminal disease that I was dying. You what? I lied. I told her I was dying. Why would you do such a thing? Because in my confused state of being and in the sin nature I was, I rationalized it that if she believed me that I was dying, she would want to spend as much time with me one-on-one. -on -one. And that's exactly what happened. One-on-one. -on -one. But I didn't realize that the first person I told that lie to would go out to 21 different people. And I had no idea that in the split second I told that lie that it would last for over seven months. And surely, I had no idea that that lie would so consume me and destroy me that I was wasting away and my mind was one confusion. The school was praying for physical healing for me. And the Lord God, who knows all and sees all, knew that I didn't need no physical healing. I needed a spiritual healing. And he answered that prayer in a mighty way. When I came to the point where I couldn't take it anymore because his hand kept pressing on me and pressing on me, and I was becoming more confused and agitated, that I finally went to that first friend that I told the lie to. And I said, make a phone call for me, please. Call my advisor at school. Tell him I need to meet with him the first thing tomorrow morning. And he is to have another faculty member with him. That morning, I met with those two men. And with tears streaming down my face, I confessed my sin. I knew that I would have to go to those 21 people and tell them the truth. But what I didn't know is I'd have to stand before the entire academic committee of that school to tell them what I had done. The night before I was to meet that committee was the longest, darkest, quietest night of my life. The shame and the guilt was unbearable where well, I began to pack my suitcase to run away. I couldn't face them. And while I'm packing, my Bible falls on the floor and it falls open face to the point where I have to bend over and pick it up just the way it laid down. And I sat on the bed and I looked down. And I looked at it. And I looked at it again. And I started chuckled and I shook my head. 
because I'm in the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah. I didn't even know they had a book of Isaiah. I mean, I didn't even know that there was such a book or what it was about, and here I am in the book of Isaiah. So I look down and I read the first line, and when I read the first line, it was, Lori had just grabbed me. He had my attention. That I couldn't stop reading. And in that darkest, quietest night of my life, I heard the voice of God that even deaf people can hear. That night when he spoke, he didn't just speak. He gave me a promise. The opening word that got my attention was, Oh, Thomas, return to the Lord your God, for you have been crushed by your sins. Take words and come back to me, for my anger will be forever gone. I will love you freely, Thomas. Your work will go deeply into the soils of Lebanon. You will blossom as a lily. Your people shall return from exile far away. And will rest beneath a shadow. He gave me that promise 30 years ago. And he's kept it. He's kept it. I have never seen his anger since that night. My feet have been planted. They shall not be moved. And people along the journey have said, Oh, you're so beautiful. Well, I used to groom and shrink and get all embarrassed. And the Lord basically touched me and reminded me of the promise. You will blossom like a lily. If the people can see the beauty in me, they see Christ in him alone. I have seen the fulfillment of Hosea 14, 1 to 8, except for the last promise of that verse. And your people shall return from exile far away and will rest beneath the shadow. That night, with that promise of making God confess he made a mistake, I fell on the floor and I cried out in anguish, my Lord, my God, have mercy. I can't live like this. I can't walk the path of silence. I resent it. I despise it. I'm lonely. I can't do it. But if this is what you're calling me to do, then you're going to have to live in me, and you're going to have to do it for me. At the age of 35, I came to the foot of the cross and my shame and my humiliation and I totally surrendered my all that I could not do it and that he would have to. From that point on, I went and I confessed before him the academic committee. 
And I remember that day as far as the tears streaming down my face, my speech being so garbled with the tear and mix. But there was one lone figure that I was fixed upon, and he was the president of the college. And his hand was in, his head was in his hand, and he was stooped over, and I saw him shaking his head back and forth, and I saw the tears coming down his face. And I realized one lone man, a stranger that didn't know me, wept for me in my shame that night. It would be a few years that I would meet up with him. <laughs> and it was a little conference. And at this conference, I had him sit right next to me at the dining room table. And I knew I wanted to speak with him alone in private to thank him. But I wasn't prepared for this moment of opening me up. And as I sat down at the table, he reached out and he took my hand. And he said, I am so proud of you. And I lost it. I totally lost it. I basically said, uh, Dr. McCorkin, uh, please excuse me. I'll be right back. And I went out. And the tears are flowing, and I'm thinking, God, he doesn't remember. He can't possibly remember. And I was trying to get my composure outside. And after prayer, I was able to suck it in and come back to him. And I looked at him, and I said, you know, Dr. McCorkin, I need to speak with you. And I need to speak as soon as possible. I know we have the whole conference, but I don't want to wait that long. And he said, well, you know, I'm speaking tomorrow morning for the opening session. Let's get together right after that session, and we'll have time together. I said, thank you. The session ended, and I'm on my way to meet with him. And lo and behold, another man comes approaching me. And he's all smiles, and he points at me, and he says, you're Sue Thomas. I said, I am. He says, I've heard so much about you. I can't wait to have some time with you. And I looked at him, and I said, how about right now? You see, that man that approached me was the current president of Columbia International University. I said, I'm on my way to meet with Dr. McWilkin, and I would like you to be there with me. Do you have anything else to do? He said, oh, no. So off we go with my friend, my associate, two women and two men, sitting around a round table. And I looked at Dr. McCook and I said, sir, I have one question for you. During your time at Columbia, your tenure, did you ever kick a student out of the college? And he pauses and he thinks, and he said, to be honest with you, I don't know. I don't think so. Then he leans forward and looks me in the eye, and he said, did we kick you out? I said, no, sir, you didn't, but you could have, and you should have, for what I did to the body. But by you not kicking, man, you taught me the scripture in real life about what it was to be forgiven, what it was to be loved, what it was to be healed, to be restored. You made all the difference. From the moment I surrendered with the transformation I had only one desire, or one desire only, 
the Lord every nation, to stand before every generation to proclaim the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me, God. And I'm thinking, how will he do this? To a single woman, a deaf woman, and with God, with a snap of a finger, all things are possible. He would use the FBI. He would use the FBI, and he would have Hollywood do a TV series. That here in the United States, some two million people watched it weekly. But more, 64 nations around the world would watch Sir Thomas FBI. And as much as when Hollywood did the story, you know Hollywood, all the glamour, my story, the true story, Hollywood wouldn't touch. So I did a DVD with the true story called Nothing But The Truth. The truth is that when I surrendered my all and I completely died and allowed him to live, there would be one of the greatest transformations that ever took place. The baggage of hatred, of bitterness, of despair would be dropped. My worst enemy, my deafness, would become my best friend. But it is only in the silence that we would truly hear that still small voice of God. It's only in the silence that he will direct our paths. We will know the difference between right and wrong. We will have a peace that surpasses all understanding that no one can touch or no one can take. The truth. I am a witness. And for whatever reason, God has sent me across this country to speak in just about every denomination that the church holds. He has led me to all the mega churches of 10,000 15, 20,000. He has allowed me to see what the church is today. And I grieve. I grieve. Long ago, this country began to go off course. It was too interested in getting the numbers rather than getting the soul. But basically today, in order to get the people, or supposedly believe to reach the people, we have to entertain them. Supposedly, the church is for the sake, and we have to make them well. And yet, the church is so sick. Why? 
because the church only talks about how easy it is to be a Christian. And we, only, we even use scripture to base the easiness. That is a free gift from God. We can't earn it. We can't deserve it. And that's so true. But they paint it with this beautiful painting and picture. That is so easy to be a Christian. And it is. And to be a Christian, all you have to do is show up on Sunday morning. And maybe show up on Wednesday. And maybe show up for Bible study or prayer time. And don't forget the sweet fellowship. And then when you leave, you just do your own thing. And when you do your own thing, you t totally live for yourself and yourself alone and not anybody else. You have never died. Do you know what it's like to die? No, the church doesn't teach that. Why would the church teach that? If the church thought that, we wouldn't get anybody in the door. And yet that is our faith. That is the rock bottom of our faith. No lies, no pretense, no showtime, no entertainment. It's just between you and God. The living God that knows all, that sees all. And that's it. If you die, and you totally die, and you allow him to live, you won't be sick anymore. You won't be upset anymore. And this is so easy to, to be able to show you this example as a witness. It's easy. I mean, it's so easy. You start the day in the morning and you have great plans for your day. Okay, this is what you want to do and this is what you're going to I'm going to go with my best friend for lunch. And all of a sudden, you get this phone call from a daughter and basically, she wants to go with her best friend for lunch, so she's going to drop off the kids at your place. And because you're the grandma, it's your responsibility to take care. So you sort of say, okay, but you're upset. You're not doing what you wanted to do. It's not going the way it's been planned. Or maybe you work all day. And you come home, and Johnny was supposed to have such and such ready for dinner, but you get home, it's not ready. What happens? There's a knot in your stomach. There's a knot in your stomach. Or what happens? Your nose starts getting out of joint. It gets out of joint. Because that's not the way I wanted. That's not what I told you to do. That's not. This is what I expected. This is what I want. I didn't want this. I wanted this. And every time your nose gets out of joint or that gut feeling gets there, ask yourself why. And when you get the answer, the true answer, you will find out it's because of the I, what the I wanted. I can guarantee you, you get rid of the I. That I die, it's just not there. You let God live in you. Anything can happen. Anything can happen. And you will know that when something happens, it has been ordained by God for good. His plans are not to harm you. His plans are for your good. Well, it took me a little while for the fine-tuning of all this as I'm growing in the Lord. 
So, you know, I mean, there's those days when I lose something, I can't find it, I start mumbling and grumbling, my nose gets all of and I get this knob, I'm supposed to be on the phone, okay? And I, I'm, I'm free of that. I'm free of that. Why? Because God has not allowed me to find it. Why? Because God sees the bigger picture down the road. Am I being caped up from an accident? Because I'm out there. Whatever the reason it is, it's for the good. But all I can do is die and allow him to live in me. I will have that peace. I will have that joy. And I don't have to worry about one single thing. And that's finances. That's health. That's nothing. Zero. Okay, now we get into this, okay? And we're going to talk a little bit about everything within the church. Well, how about the spiritual warfare? So what about the spiritual warfare? Aren't you upset with this? Oh, yeah, there's spiritual warfare. But guess what? <laughs> it's already been won. Jesus is victor. So why are we spending our time with this, okay? I, yes, before, first, the benediction, and then after the benediction, the war. That's the way it is. The benediction is first. The war is second. We go through it with the battlefield. But by God's grace, it's been won. I've been deaf all of my life. I broke the sound barrier. I was free. And just when I thought I was running off, riding into the sunset, God said, Thomas, I want to take you deeper. I want to take you deeper. So what did he do? He gave me the affliction of multiple sclerosis. For the last 15 years, I have walked with this disease, and I will testify that it makes my deafness pale in comparison. The affliction. God has gave it. He has allowed it not to harm me, but that I might prosper and be good. Why? Because I've seen grace in a way that I have never known before. And I lean totally on him from day to day. As a witness, I came to share the truth with him. In sharing the truth, I'm going to give you one more big thing for you to think about, for you to pray about, because this is our church today. I, I walk in, and we have the music team. And basically, we're talking about mega churches, small churches, whatever. We have the music team. And these people have been picked as the music team because they have beautiful voices. They're going to lead the music. Right. Now, I can't hear the music, but this is what I'm saying. The team's up on the platform, and they got the, the microphones in front of them. And the music's dying. And basically... They start swaying and going with the music and rejoicing in the Lord, okay? But this is what I see with the team, with the woman. Low cut blouses with sweaters, mini tight skirts, knee length, leather boots, and they're up there jiving and they're swaying. And I'm going to tell you the truth. No man sitting in the pew is going to have any attention on God Almighty when he has a woman like that in front of him. This is our sanctuary today. Our sanctuary today. You come in, the sanctuary is the greatest fellowship hall of all time. Kid running up and down, chatter everywhere, laughter going 
When was the last time the sanctuary was a place set aside for the holiness of God to come in silence with a heart to be still, to seek Him, to thank Him? When? Our faith is gone. And he knows it. And in the last few days, I've been going back and spending time in the book of the prophets. And each prophet on a certain day, I'll read for that day. And it overlaps, overlaps. And it all says the same. Return to the Lord God. Almighty. Return to the Lord God Almighty. Our church has not heed that prophecy. And we are about to see the unleashing hand of God that has been handed before through the generation. For those people with a proud heart going away from God, doing their own thing. If this is why God has made me dumb, to have a funny voice, to be able to proclaim the truth, the whole truth, and nothing else but the truth. You see? In my sinful ways, I'm not all that different from the first woman Christ revealed himself to. A sinner. A defiled woman. And he told her to go to make it known that he is risen. Indeed, I don't know you. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you've been. I don't know where you're at. And I don't know where you're going. But I will tell you that if you are truly a person of faith, don't you dare tell anyone you are a Christian. Unless you have walked the walk, I'm going to that cross. Because it's no longer any good to talk the talk. That's all we've been doing. Give real. Be truthful. And die. That you might live. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we come before you to thank you and to praise you to still have this sanctuary, Father, in our midst when we realize the hard times will be upon us, Lord. The soon one day the doors of the sanctuary will be forever closed and locked. Father, give us the new understanding of our faith, of who you are, Father, of what you are, and who you have so created us to be. Your creation, Father, made in your image that you might be glorifying, that you might be exalted that you might have communion with us in a sweet fellowship. Father, have mercy upon us, for we know not what we have done. Our sins are many, and our words and our thoughts 
by what we have done, by what we have failed to do. Lord, please, strengthen us. Strengthen us, Lord, for only one purpose, that we might have the strength to return to you with all of our hearts, Father, that we will return to you in our shame and in our guilt, that your anger will be forever gone. How long, Lord, will your patience endure? How long before you say enough? Lord, it is my prayer for the body of this church that you will move in a powerful way that you will speak to them, Father, that you will speak the word, that they will be convicted, Lord, that they will grow in you, in your ways. Lord, take the deafness from their ears. Take the hardness on the heart. Help them, Father, to totally to die and surrender. That you will give them life in abundance. Help the sanctuary return to the place of this founding, dedicated and concentrated anew to you. Not about showtime, Lord. Not about showtime. Not about entertainment. Not about reaching the numbers. But, Lord, that they're committed to touching and reaching the soul and building up. That each one of its members shall be strong and in the strength that this church will be strong, strong as a witness to the community that something different has taken place. The people that hunger for you will be driven to the sanctuary. Our oh, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to know what is right, what is wrong, we thank you for your leading, Father, and we pray for the leadership, Lord, that you will give them boldness, that you will give them strength, that you will give them truth, that they will lead, that the people will follow, that they will be shepherds of this flock, that know their sheep, by name, that they will know the waywardness and the ways of the people that will lead them back to you. We cry out to you, Father, for goodness and mercy. We thank you for your loving kindness and your patience that you have given. Father, touch our hearts that we may return to you before your wrath becomes upon us. We pray this, Lord. Hear us and answer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for bringing us here tonight. Thank you for bringing Sue Thomas this way. Thank you for the testimony that you've given to her and the boldness and the faith. Thank you, Lord, that she's willing to tell the truth 
the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you for making us here tonight become honest with you and honest with ourselves and realize, Lord, that much of the time our attention and our focus is on me and us. And our prayer is focused upon what you can do for us and what you can do for me instead of how I can serve you. God, thank you for the times in our lives that crush us. Thank you for the difficulties, Father, when you bring us to a point where there's no way but your way. And then you move. And we know it's you. And you deepen our relationship with you. And we praise you, Father. And we can understand, James. One in verse two, that we give thanks for the various trials that come our way. Father, may our focus, all of our attention, be on Jesus, on proclaiming His name and His gospel to our very last breath. And Father in heaven, we do pray that you would forgive us for playing church. For talking the talk but not walking the walk. Thank you for the conviction that, that I'm under right now, that we're under right now. Thank you for the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit. Oh, Father, more than anything else, we need you. And we want to die to ourselves that you might live in us, that we might live for you, that we might, that we might have that that intimacy of a relationship with you that, that is beyond anything that, is this, that this world could ever offer. That comes only through Jesus. Father, forgive us for idle talk. For gossip. For pride. Bring us to the end of ourselves that we might find you. And then, Lord, bring revival. Move in and through your church and your people. For we who call ourselves followers of Jesus, may we truly be followers of Jesus. Lord, thank you for this night. Thank you for bringing Sue Thomas to Greenville so that she could find herself by the providence of God at your church at Northgate. And thank you, God, for, for calling us here tonight that we might experience something that you have done through one of your servants. Lord, bless her. Father, we pray healing on her life from MS. But Father, more so, we pray you would bring glory and honor to your name through her and through her testimony. We love you. Forgive us of our sin and our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Create in us a clean heart that we might serve you afresh and with new enthusiasm and with revival. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Easter. Thank you for new life, for an empty tomb. 
thank you for a Savior. For we'll carry his banner high. We will not be ashamed of the gospel that has rescued us. Father, we love you. We worship you tonight. And we pray this and we pray all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sue has books in the vestibule. You'll be interested in seeing them, um, reading them, getting to know her better, hearing more of her story. Uh, the television show she was talking about, FBI, F-B-E-Y-E, -E, uh, was on PAX Network from 2002, I believe, until 2005. And you can find it. I've, um, you can watch episodes. Fascinating. Fascinating. Uh, God's work in and through her. So, uh, Sue, thank you very much. Thank you for coming this way tonight and being obedient to the Lord and sharing your story. For you've taught, God's taught us through you tonight. Thank you. Let's say thank you to Sue. That's right. Amen.